Garden of Eden, but before Abraham. And we looked at the Tower of Babel, we looked at the Flood, and I just want to revisit both of those uh, one more time to ask the question of, why did these things happen? And then next week we'll talk about the generations and the genealogies, <coughs> and we'll stop there. I wanted to stop this pure, talking about this part of the Bible today, but there's just too much stuff, and it would be too long of a lesson. Okay, so what caused the Flood? Does anybody have any ideas? Sin. Sin. Could you be more specific? People were sinning and got fed, got fed up with it. What were they doing? Oh. Wicked things. Yeah. They were violent. What weren't they doing? <laughs> what were they doing, right? What did you say? It says violence had, had uh, corrupted the earth and stuff, so I'm assuming there was widespread chaos. And stuff yeah. there. I don't think they were doing anything different than what like people are doing today. The purge. No. Okay. Oh, Elaborate. Beside, besides uh, cynicism, is there anything else that causes you to say that? <laughs> Wait, what, what? I mean, like, uh, like what? How did they sin? Yeah. Uh, murder. They were probably all Democrats, and that was a problem. <laughs> I'm joking. Just joking. Sex, just joking. Uh, homosexuality, <laughs> lesbian. <laughs> you just I think the difference between then and now was everybody was doing it then, right? And now it's not everybody. Not like Noah was like the only righteous one, right? Besides his, besides his family. Right. No, yeah, Noah and his family. Well, you see, I, I for a long time actually thought that the flood was caused from whatever was going on with the Nephilim. And I was like, you know, and then I, I was wrong. <laughs> So uh, if you are familiar with the other ancient um, ancient accounts of the flood, my funny, the, the funniest one, I think, is the one that says that the gods got tired of people being too noisy. And so they say, eh, we're just going to drown them all. <laughs> well, that's, there, there was a, there's a story oh that I studied in the history of this. Uh, I forgot what culture it was, but they had one where the gods were they were fighting, and they cut themselves in the water street out, and that's how the flood Oh, oh, poor, <laughs> poor people, <laughs> poor gods. Ow. <laughs> yeah. So in Genesis six, it picks up the story after talking about um, some genealogies, which we'll talk about next week. It says, when man began to multiply on the face of the land, um, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. I like how it says that they saw that they were attractive. Like, hey, she got it going on. <laughs> Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for his flesh his days shall be 120 years. Then a feeling were on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. See, I thought that, I thought that was why the flood happened. All as a kid. And then, you know, as an adult, I read more in verse 5, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man, whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Two completely different things are happening here. Verses 1 through 4, that's one thing. And this verses 5 and onward, that's something else. See, I didn't know that growing up. So I... Eh. You guys all seem like this is old news to you, so I feel like, you know, the, the odd the odd duck here, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> so is what what Isaiah said, the continual evil, that was the reason for the flood, not the Nephilim. What is Nephilim? Well, I will come to that in just a minute. <laughs> um, so verses 1 through 4, men were taking a bunch of wives and were... So, okay, let's look at this actually in, in a few different parts. First off... It says here that the men were taking a lot of different wives. We don't know exactly what this means. This could mean a few things. First off, it could mean that there were mixed marriages. Okay, so basically those who were serving God were marrying those who were not. Um, I really don't think that that's what it's saying, but it could be. Um, another option is that the um, the mighty men, so the like kings and chieftains and whatnot, that they were just taking women. For instance, um, there's a there's a much more recent practice that's known where a chief would um, take a woman who's being married and get her for the first night and then the husband would have her for the rest of the time. 
So there's been the assumption that maybe that's the kind of thing that was happening. Um, and I really don't think that it's that complicated. It just seems like we're talking about men are just taking a bunch of wives. Now, why is this important? Well, because that would mean that they were um, reproducing very quickly. And with that many people reproducing very quickly, if they lived too long, they would just get themselves into a bunch of trouble. I mean, just think about this. If there's three people, they're less likely to get in trouble than if there's 50 people. Do you see what I mean? Like, <laughs> people just kind of egg each other on to do stupid things. Um, and so then that takes us to the question of what are the Nephilim? Now, a lot of people um, have thought or taught that, um, that the Nephilim were uh, fallen angels, that people were, were, were having sex with these angels. And, well, we know that angels can't have sexual relations, so that just doesn't really seem to fit. But assuming that they could, um, there's nothing really here to warrant that. Um, I find Craig Keener's explanation to be the most realistic. Uh, he he's talk he takes the word apart and shows how it should probably be translated as um, more talking about these leaders. Let's let's just call them chiefs for the for the current time being. Let's just call them chiefs that this was a time when there were a lot of these really strong chiefs, and that's all it's saying. If, if you look, it doesn't even say that the Nephilim were actually the ones having the sex. I'll, I'll read it again. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. It doesn't say that the Nephilim were, were mating with anybody. It just says that they were there. So with that being said, let's remember that Nephilim aren't really that big of a point in the story. And if you read a lot of books like I do, you'll see that People have written entire books about the Nephilim and talking about them and debating who they were. And it's not really a key point of the story. It's just simply saying that this was at the time when they were. So we don't really know what they were. Maybe they were fallen angels. Maybe they were chieftains. We don't really know. Um, uh, some people even think that they were, they were possibly giants because there's a, that kind of relates uh, to a word that's in, I think it's numbers. Um, or maybe Joshua, I don't remember. Uh, but... Um, all those things are great. We really don't know. Whatever it was, it was some someone of power, be it angels or giants or chiefs. Um, okay. Now, in verse 6, it says something that's kind of troubling. It says, uh, And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Now, that caused a lot of people some concern. What does it mean that God regretted something? I mean, didn't he know what would happen? And the word here translated as regret is, is a little more complicated than that. But, but without going into that, we can we can say this. Yes, God did know that it would happen, but it grieved him. It it, it even though he knew it was gonna happen, it still bothered him when it did happen. You know what I mean? Have you ever known what somebody was gonna do and you're still kinda disappointed when they did it? Yeah. I mean I've done that before. So we we shouldn't really read too much into that saying, oh, well, God didn't know. Well, no, he did know. It's just, um, And I, I've already talked about that before in another lesson a while back, so I really don't want to waste too much time on that. Um, now, <coughs> what this basically comes down to is God is patient, but he's not inactive. A lot of times people have a, have a problem with the idea that God could be a loving God and yet still bring punishment, and I just don't really see the see the problem with that because I have kids <laughs> you know what I mean you can be patient with your kids and then still there be some kind of punishment when they choose not to obey you know what I mean like I, I, I really don't get the, con the connect that an example of this would be um, Sodom and Gomorrah when they were punished was there a question? no I'm gonna just throw something at there Jeremiah 17.4, for instance, he's going to do it again. Jeremiah 17.4, I think, is a really good example of this. Now, some people have misquoted this verse, and I'm going to read what it actually says, and I'm going to tell you what they misquoted it as saying. You, um, in 17.4, You shall loosen your hand from your heritage that I gave to you, and I will make you serve your enemies' land that you do not know. He's talking to Judah right before they fell. For in my anger a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. Now, some people have have misread that and thought that it was saying that God's anger would burn forever. And then they say, well, it says that God's anger won't burn forever. Well, it didn't actually say that his anger would burn forever. It said, a fire is kindled that shall burn 
in my anger a fire was kindled. See, the fire would burn forever. Now, how can a fire possibly burn forever? Well, actually, if you read in Jude, it talks about how Sodom and Gomorrah um, burn continually. Now, what does that mean? It means it is a, um, a sign for people of, of, of God's wrath. And so with that being said, there, there is a certain element of, yes, God is patient. However, um, when faced with continual rebellion, he does take action against that. Um, now, uh, before I move on from the flood, there was one more thing I wanted to say. After the flood, God says that the that the rainbow is going to be a sign about uh, how he won't ever bring global uh, punishment on all people uh, through through flooding. He won't he won't wipe out humanity with, with a flood ever again. Now, obviously, we know that. Lower, I want to say, grade floods have happened, and lesser, lesser humanity. I shouldn't say lesser humanity. Um, floods have happened, and people have died from floods. And I talked about this last week, um, but never on a scale that has threatened humanity's existence. Okay, since the flood, I should say. Um, but with that being said, there were already rainbows on the earth when God made that promise. We shouldn't think that that was the first flood. As we read in Genesis 1, God had created the water cycle of all the way back on day, what was it, 3? 2 or 3? So there had to have been rainbows if there was, in fact, <laughs> rain. <laughs> so with that being said, uh, uh, the flood didn't begin rainbows. All that God did was he attributed meaning to something after the fact. He had created the created the rainbow afterward, and then after the flood, he said, "Okay, did you see that rainbow? From now on, that will be my sign to you of what's go of, of what I'm going to do in the future." So he gave meaning to something that already existed. That shouldn't that shouldn't uh, bother us. That's that was a very common practice from from the day. Um, in fact, sometimes it'll say, "This is why the city was called that," but that city was called that before then, before those people were ever there. So I mean. It's just kind of a way of, of, of bringing the past and giving it new meaning in the, in the present. So now that takes us to the Tower of Babel, and, and I want to ask a very similar question of the Tower of Babel as we just did with the Flood, uh, as to why. So first, we, we really do have to look at kind of a, an outline of the Tower of Babel as a whole. And you'll see that it, it's, it's, what, it's what's called a chiasm. Now, what that means is the end relates to the beginning, and it just kind of um, – there's this kind of um, symmetry between the whole thing, and then there's a middle point, and that middle point is kind of the main point. So, for instance, uh, the Tower of Babel account starts as the whole world did something, and then it ends with the whole earth. The whole uh, er world had one language. The Lord confused the language. They went to Shinar and settled there. Um, it happened in Babel because there the Lord confused the language. Um, the people said, come, let's make bricks, and God said, come, let us go down and confuse them. Um, okay. Come, let us build, and then it says uh, at, at the end that the men were building a city with a tower to see the city and a tower, and the, the central point there being that the Lord came down. So if you read it through, the whole world had one language, Shinar, and Shinar and settled there, come, let's make bricks, come, let us build a, sour, a city with a tower. But the Lord came down to see the city and tower that the men were building, come, let us go down and confuse Babel, because there the Lord confused the language, the whole earth, of the whole earth. So did you see how it works like that? That's, that's called chiasm, okay? Now, if you are familiar with the Tower of Babel story, you know that it is annoyingly short. <laughs> there is really no explanation given. It just kind of rushes through the narrative, barely gives us any any of what the people are saying, barely gives us anything of what God says, and it just kind of seems like, what the heck? <laughs> Couldn't you have given us a little bit more uh, explanation? And so that brings us to the question of, so what is the issue at the Tower of Babel? Now, people have typically said a few different things. The first one that people say is, is that people were prideful. And that's why God drove them out. Okay. The second one is they were being disobedient to God, that God said, hey, go out and fill the whole, the whole earth. But as we looked at a couple weeks ago, God actually didn't command them to go out and fill the earth. That was a blessing that he gave to them. You get to do this. Hooray for you. <laughs> and so it really wasn't disobedience because that was a blessing. You know what I mean? That's like, for instance, God says, hey, you guys are married. You guys can have sex. Well, let's not have sex. Well, God didn't command you to have sex. He just said you could. I mean, whatever. 
Um, and then, so another view, as, as proposed by um, John Walton, was that um, he believes that the Tower of Babel are ziggurats, which I talked about a couple weeks ago how I thought that they were not the ziggurats. But he assumes that they are the ziggurats, and the ziggurats were basically a way for the gods to come down. And so he sees it more of a problem of they were viewing God as less, as someone who needed them. Um, so basically the sin there was 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 that they were attributing to God a character that was not like God. They were saying that he was not self-sufficient, that he was not um, completely independent and, and sovereign from them, but that he was subject to them. Now, I, I really don't think that because as I've already kind of mentioned, I believe that the ziggurats were an afterthought, and I will come back to that again. Um, now, it is important to mention this, and we're going to talk about the genealogies later. So I don't want to spend too much time here. But before the Tower of Babel, it talks about Shem, who's one of the sons of Noah. There's Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And Shem is, is the last uh, son of Noah that it is talked about uh, before the account of the Tower of Babel. And it talks about Eber. And Eber has two children. One, ch one, one, um, one child is uh, talked about all the way up to the Tower of Babel. And then the second one is Peleg. And Peleg um, is eventually um, gives birth to Abram. So we have these two descendants of Eber. One gives birth to Abram, who's the, who's the one of the promise, and the other one gives birth to these other people who are just live in in in, Bab in the Babylonian area. Um, and one one family line gets a blessing, the other one gives a curse. And it seems like the main point here. Especially, the, I'll get to the word play in just a second, but it seems like the point being that the people on the left chose curses while the people born from Peleg, who ended up leaving Bab uh, the area of Babel, they got uh, blessings. And I don't think it's any, um, it's any mistake that Babel is later connected with um, Babylon. The idea being um, going east was leaving God's promises and seeking the, the pleasures of the world, and going back west, as Abraham did, um, was uh, was and I'll I'll kind of tie this in a little bit more next week, but um, the idea being there that um, Peleg's line isn't really elaborated on until after the Tower of Babel story. Let me kind of show you what I'm talking about. It's in Genesis 10. If you want to turn there, or if you wanted to look later, um, it says in chapter 10, starting in verse 21. To Shem also the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem, and it goes through them. And it says, To Eber were born two sons, and the one was Peleg, which eventually gave birth to Abram. And for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Then it goes through Joktan's family line. Joktan fathered this guy and these other people. And it goes through, and then it, it leaves Peleg off. It doesn't, ever, it doesn't elaborate anymore on Peleg. And it says, These are the clans of, of the sons of Noah according to the genealogies, and they go straight to the Tower of Babel. The emphasis, of course, being there that his family line missed out on the blessing. But then if, after, the tower, after the Tower of Babel, verse 9, Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused um, the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed him over the face of the earth. Now it goes back to verse 10. Check this out. These are the generations of Shem. Wait, didn't we just look at Shem? But then you go through. Shem had, had Arpaxad, Arpaxad had Shela, Shela had Eber, Eber had Peleg, Peleg had Ru, Ru had Sarek, uh, Sarek had Nahor, and Nahor had Terah, who then had Abram. So here we have you know, these two family lines, and the contrast then being um, the evils of Babylon uh, with the blessings of God. Um, now, this is important because I suggested that the Tower of Babel came before the pyramids of Egypt and before the ziggurats. Now, I've already talked about that last week or the week before, so I really don't want to visit that again. But I want to visit this idea. The ziggurats were built with this idea that it was a place for the gods to come down. Now, you'd have to be just not paying attention to see how that connects us with the Tower of Babel. We just looked at how they, they built this tower to glorify themselves, and then right in the middle it says, but the Lord came down. My belief is that after the Tower of Babel was abandoned and it fell to shambles, they remembered this and that they built... Um, towers again in the future ho in hopes that their gods would come down as they remembered God coming down at the Tower of Babel. That's my own personal belief. I have nothing to back it up other than it fits. That's it. 
Um, however, there is a strong um, kind of idea throughout the Bible, Genesis especially, the idea of west to east, going east being leaving God's presence and going west being coming into God's presence. Uh, for instance, the, tower, the tabernacle, the opening was on the east side. You had to go west to go into the holy place. Um, and then it says, you know, when they left the Garden of Eden, they, they went east. And then we saw what happened there with the flood. And then after the flood, it says that they went east and built a tower there to glorify themselves. So, I mean, there's this the whole idea of east being leaving God's presence because the paradise, the Garden of Eden, that God's presence was left back there in the west, and they were leaving in the east. Um, now, there is a word play all throughout the Tower of Babel. Shem is spelled the exact same as name. So when it says that they – it says, okay, this is Shem's family line. Then it says that they were trying to make a name, Shem, for themselves. So there's this it, – it, they do this actually very frequently in the Hebrew Bible. It's word plays where, where a word will sound or be spelled very similar to each other, and it will just kind of uh, bounce back and forth. You, you really don't get that a whole lot in English because our, our word translations don't even look like they came from the same word. Um, but anyways um, – um, and so the idea being there, then after the Tower of Babel, it goes back to talking about Shem again. So the main point, of course, being that they are trying to make a name for themselves. Now let's keep going here. Um, I don't think I want to talk about this. Well, why not? Um, now... There is a foreshadowing in the story of the Tower of Babel where it points to Babylon. and Because Babel is not Babylon. However, it's in the same area. And as they often do in the Old Testament, if something's in the same area, they'll say that it's the same city when it actually isn't the same city. We'll worry about that when we, when we look at the Exodus. They do that throughout the Exodus story. Um, and uh, so what, what do I want to say here? There's so many things I want to say about this, but I don't want to make it go too long. Um, so the idea here is that this is foreshadowing the evil that will one day happen through Babylon, through not just the evil of Babylon, but then the evil that Babylon did to Israel later on. Once again, the whole idea of contrasting, cursing, and blessing. Now, it... John Walton, I mentioned him earlier with his view of, about the Tower of Babel being the Ziggurats. The, the, it never says that Babel was built for a god or gods or for a god to come down. So I think that simply saying it must be a Ziggurat because a Ziggurat was in that area much after the Tower of Babel, that, that doesn't really fit to me. All that the story does say is that Babel was a place for man to be lifted up. Now, I believe – let's tie some things in here. I believe that what the, the account in Genesis 11 is saying is that the Tower of Babel and the city there was built not for the sake of a god or gods, but rather to lift man up into the place of God. Now, let me kind of give you some, some backdrop as to why I think this. In Genesis 11, it says – in the story, the whole earth had one language and, and the same words, and as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone by two men for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, with its top in the heavens, so that we, down here, can go up. Okay? Um... And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. It doesn't sound like there's a thought of honoring a god or gods. It doesn't really seem like it has anything to do with god worship. It seems like it has to do with self-worship. Now, this is incre incredibly important because – and I'll look at this later. Babylon had this idea that they were the <laughs> origin of right and wrong. Now, let me come back to that, okay? If Babel was built before ziggurats, it may have influenced the idea of that would later become the ziggurat. Now, I already kind of mentioned that, so I really don't want to belabor that point. And, but I do want to say how, how odd it is that the blessing from chapter 1, go forth, multiply, conquer the earth, you know, live long and prosper, you know, this whole Star Trek thing here, that now, just a few chapters later, it has turned into, into a, a curse for them. 
God say, hey, here's this blessing, and, and now they're like, lest we be dispersed in the earth. In the earth. It's like, well, I mean, okay. <laughs> like that was God's blessing to you, and you're kind of taking it backwards. Now, with that being said, to just kind of pasteurize here a little bit, um, I did. I have noticed that in life, things that God intends for a blessing to us can oftentimes turn into a curse for us if we're too self-absorbed to notice. It's just something that happens in life. I mean, think about, well, jobs. I'm really thankful for my job, but sometimes it can be to the point where I kind of – how to say this the right way? Don't really want that job. See what I mean? So God's blessing to me actually turns into kind of, I make it a curse. Not that it is a curse, but I kind of treat it like it's a curse. Does that kind of make sense? Now, obviously, that's that's kind of a lot smaller scale than the Tower of Babel, but I hope you kind of see the point. Um, so then that takes us to God's rebuke. Listen to what God actually says. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. Nothing bad so far. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Okay, that sounds a little bit ominous, but not necessarily bad. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down in their confuser language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So that kind of leaves us with the question that God didn't really give a clear – did you hear anywhere in there a clear explanation of what was wrong? Because I didn't. They're speaking one language. They're living together. This all sounds fine. Maybe, maybe the fact that nothing would be impossible for them so that basically that they would grow – Independent, independent from God and not, not to be dependent on Him. Maybe that was, what was, that could be something that's from potentially. In the, okay. In the, I see what you're saying. You know what I mean? Mhm. Mm I do see what you're saying. That's worth consideration. That's worth thought. I wonder. It seems like. In some places, God hasn't necessarily had such a swift corrective measure when people were independent from him. I wonder why he would have taken such severe stance then when he didn't at other times. I'm not saying that that's not – I'm not I'm not saying that's not what happened, but just – that's something to think about. That is something to think about. So one thing that I noticed is I looked at this word here. Um, I don't know if you know about it, but I looked it up in Brown Driver, Brown Driver Biggs. It's basically the authority on, on Hebrew lexicons. And it pointed something out here. When it says nothing that they propose, that sounds awful mellow. I think the N NKJV, if you have that, um, read verse um, 6, please. Let's see if it has it. <clears throat> and the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, and they... And they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Hmm, you have proposed too. Yeah. But if you notice, the NKJV did say withheld instead of impossible. Yeah. Um, I was reading in one of the translations, I really thought it was the NKJV. And it used the word, not. it didn't use the word propose, it used the word, um, not scheme, but it was a word like it. Um, that they, like connive to do, or um, plot, was it plot? It was a word like that, and I looked up and I looked this word up, and it actually does have that kind of a meaning in this context. And you could be much better translated, I believe, much better. No evil thing that they scheme with will be withheld. In other words, having them all together in this big city, they're gonna they're gonna start doing a lot of bad things. I I've got to act here to keep them from doing these bad things. And remember, the flow the flood has just ha not just happened. I mean, we're talking about maybe. Hundreds of thousands of years between the Tower of Babel and the Flood. Don't, I'm not saying that. Chapter-wise, in the book of Genesis, chapter-wise, the Flood has just happened. And we know that God's not going to flood them again <laughs> because he just said, I'm not going to. So what's he going to do now? Well, now he's heading off the, the evil before it gets too great. This is not going to end well. It's like when you see your child standing on their chair dancing and you think, this is not going to end well. They're going to slip and fall and hit their head. I'm going to intervene and take them off their chair before they fall off of it. <laughs> a recipe for disaster. <laughs> right, right, a recipe for disaster. And it seems like that's what that like that's what God's saying here. So I really don't like the, the ESV translation on this one because it doesn't really, I don't think, captures the essence of it. It just kind of sounds like God's like, I'm bored. 
let's go see what these people... Oh, let's just mess with them. Let's just mess things up. You know, that's how it sounds like in the ESV. I really don't think that's what God's doing. Like, I, I'm bored, and they're working real hard on this. I want to frustrate them, just because I think that'd be funny. <laughs> I really just don't see God doing that. Um, um, okay, so no evil thing, they scheme will be withheld. The idea here is that they are God for themselves. They are creating their own source of what's good and what's bad. And that seems to be the issue there. It's not just pride. It's pride and self to the degree of the abandonment of God. That's the issue of Babel. And once again, Babel foreshadows the city, the great city that would once be there, Babylon. And Babylon itself foreshadows other great evil cities. For instance, Peter called Rome Babylon. The Babylon kind of in the Bible becomes kind of a symbol of, of, of great evil. You know, even in the book of Revelations where it talks about Babylon the whore, you know? <laughs> and... Uh, Okay, so they were headed to danger. That seems to be what, what God's rebuke had to do. Um, now, it is important, and I would be, uh, I think, really off base not to mention this, that Babylon as a city was later considered a holy city. And a lot of the cities that were in that area, Ur, Uruk, Eridu, they were all considered uh, holy cities. Um, now, some of them were more holy. I believe it was Eridu. Um, I think it was that one that uh, was said to have actually come down from heaven. I believe it was that city. I'm not not positive. It's been a long time since I read that myth, but I, I want to say that. And another thing that's kind of interesting with the flood, with the flood account and, and other, um, for instance, the Sumerian kings list mentions the flood too. Um, it mentions how people lived longer before the flood than after, just like the Bible does. Um, and another thing that it mentions is it says that kingship, kings came down from heaven, which obviously king is going to say, I came from heaven, obviously. But um, And the Bible doesn't tell us that kings developed until, well, if, if the Nephilim are those same kings, then that would be not until Genesis chapter 6. So that gives us possibly hundreds and thousands of years, I don't know, however long. Um, so uh, that's kind of an important issue about the whole holy city thing, because remember, if they had this idea... And then the Bible, and then the, the Bible says, "Hey, there's this great evil city, Babel. It's in the same area as those your holy cities." And, you know, kind of like a, I guess you could say, condemnation of their popular belief. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, and I, I think it is kind of ironic that there's a complete reversal of what of what happened. So they say, "Okay, let's come and build this city so that we won't get dispersed." And then God comes and He says, "Okay, uh, now your language is all different." And so then the city wasn't built and they were dispersed. Like, exactly the thing that they didn't want to happen is exactly what did happen. Which brings us to a few lessons from the book of Proverbs. Their pride actually became their downfall, literally. Literally, their pride became their downfall. You read about that in books like Proverbs, but you never really connect the dots. Here we have an actual story of that happening. And then the second thing, as mentioned in Proverbs, what they feared came on them. It talks about the, the desires of wicked people and stuff and how it you know turns into stuff that doesn't happen and whatnot. And so here we have both of those things from the book of Proverbs. Um, I just think that's kind of funny. Um, and so that brings us to the idea that there, there's kind of this idea uh, nowadays if we would all just get together that we can have peace and unity. That's a very naive view of humanity. Humanity, as much as we try and whitewash this, we've got a serious problem. And it doesn't seem to be getting any worse. I mean, any better, even with our you know, modernization and, and, and culture and those kind of, it doesn't seem to be fixing the problem. Which leads me to a, a, what I believe one of the things is that, that we can learn from this. A one world er order isn't going to make us live in this perfect, peaceful harmony. It's just going to multiply evil. You get a bunch of people living together, even if they're under one roof, that's just a, that's just a recipe for, for disaster. I mean, we can't even do this, do the right thing when we're by ourselves. What are the chances that we're going to suddenly be right just by all of us getting together? I mean, that's just a bad idea. If there, if there were no laws, you know, it would, I think humanity would, um, would just... Self-implode? <laughs> yeah, it's, it'd be like the purge, you know. It's like, we can do whatever we want, you know. It's... You know, honestly, there's, there's, that, there's that first moment where you think, no, that's ridiculous. They, they would, and then you stop and think about it, and you're like, no, actually, yeah. Humanity would would self implode like uh, yeah. dear dear God. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so God brought disunity as as funny as it sounds for the sake of their salvation. He knew what was happening. He knew what was going to, going to happen. And rather than just let them destroy themselves, he decided to bring disunity among the people so that he could then raise up Abraham to bring salvation to all people. Now, this sounds a little bit circular to us, but we saw we saw on the flood <laughs> how, you know, if God doesn't intervene, uh, people just keep doing really, really stupid things. So that takes me to Habakkuk 1.7. Now remember, Babel is a foreshadowing of Babylon. And the prophets oftentimes allude back to Babel without, as necess without necessarily causing too much attention to it. And I believe, personally, that Habakkuk 1.7 1, is an example of this. Remember I said about how their, their great crime was that they were raising man up to godhood. And that kind of speaks of the idea of, uh, uh, you know, not not following God's laws, not following God's ways. And Habakkuk 1.7 says this. They are dreaded, talking about Babylon, they are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. They have their own idea of justice, their own idea of right and wrong. It goes forth from themselves, not from not from God. Um, so I believe... What's the what was the issue of the flood? People were being very very evil. What's the issue of Babel? <laughs> People were trying to be up there with God, um, and and so I, we're going to stop there. But I did want to mention one more thing. Um, I made a note because I actually forgot to include it anywhere. You see a lot of things kind of mirroring the idea of the Tower of Babel. You see the pyramids, for instance. You have these pharaohs that are buried there. And then they have these giant things so that they're not forgotten. You have people having seances so that the people are not forgotten. The ziggurats, for the gods, but really it was it was for them. And then you have the Tower of Babel so that they are not forgotten. This constant pursuit in mankind to not be forgotten, to be glorified, to be, you know, whatnot. And you see the in Genesis you see the exact opposite true of people who wanted to glorify God. Enoch, for instance, there wasn't even a, even a body left. But he walked with God. And he was honored by God for it. But there was nothing left of him. See what I mean? And you have this strong contrast in Genesis between these righteous people and these wicked people. These people who don't care if there's a name for themselves, just want more of God. And these people who want nothing but a name for themselves. Um, so kind of the contrast of the pride of self or walking with God. And this is really a theme throughout the Bible. And I think for that to that end, the Tower of Babel is kind of an important story because you see it repeated all throughout the Bible of uh, pride and self-will versus humility. So any questions for tonight? We're, we're going to look at the generations and genealogies next week, but any questions for this week? No? We're good?